The, the U.S. is not and cannot be the global hegemon. China is not experiencing the same disruptions uh, that uh, came from the sanctions regimes, which have been some sense boomeranged on the sanctioning countries. Hello, 大家好，欢迎回到外媒看中国，我是安博然。Today I have a very special guest, U.S. economist and Columbia University professor Jeffrey Sachs. I'm using this opportunity to ask the professor a bunch of varied questions, largely centering around China, from avoiding war to poverty alleviation to China's low inflation to whether or not the U.S. will accept the emergence of a new multipolar world order. This is Reports on China. I'm Andy Borham in Shanghai. Let's get reporting. It's an absolute pleasure to introduce today's guest, who is not only a Columbia University professor, but also has served as a special advisor to the UN Secretary General, advised numerous governments in economics and inflation, written a book called *The End of Poverty*, and he's been named one of the 100 most influential people in the world by Time Magazine twice. Professor Jeffrey Sachs, thank you so much for coming on the show. Pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Now it's not often I get the chance to chat with such、uh, an accomplished person. So today I'm hoping to ask you a handful of、uh, quite general questions relating to a number of different topics.、Um, first, I want to talk with you a bit about the supposed switch、um, from a unipolar world, which is dominated by U.S. hegemony, to a multipolar world where other governments, especially in the global South. Are given more agency and, and more say in how the world is run. So lately, I've really kind of felt that the switch to a multipolar world has accelerated quite a bit, especially with the diplomatic gains China has made in the Middle East. So I was wondering if you believe that we're truly heading into a new multipolar paradigm, and I was also wondering what you think that might look like. Well, the world is changing, and it's changing very fast. From、uh, Not just a unipolar world with the U.S.、Uh, role as a so-called hegemon, but really from a North Atlantic-led world of the last two centuries to、uh, a world where economy, finance, power is much more spread around the world. The industrial era began in England. It's uh, uh, therefore no real surprise that. England or Britain became the first、uh, industrial global empire,、uh, and uh, Britain ruled the seas uh, and uh, really ruled much of the world during the 19th century. And other European newly industrialized countries、uh, formed their own empires in Africa and in Asia, and that. Western-led or North Atlantic-led world continued throughout the 20th century,、uh, but after two disastrous world wars and a Great Depression, the、uh, global leadership of the North Atlantic shifted from Western Europe and Britain、uh, to the United States. So the U.S. has been the dominant power since 1945, but with independence. Uh, of India, the end of empire across Africa, the、uh, restoration of real sovereignty、uh, of China, starting with the formation of the People's Republic in 1949, and with the economics that has followed that, the world economy has rebalanced. The spread of technology has become、uh, far more equal. China, of course, has become. One of the lead economies and centers of innovation of the world, India is one of the fastest growing、uh, large economies of the world. The world's changing, and for me, a, a notable point is that the BRICS countries—Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa—now,、uh, when measured. At so-called international prices, have larger output than the G7 countries, than the United States, Canada, Britain, France, Italy, Germany, and Japan. So that's a notable change. All of this means we're moving to a multipolar world. None of it means that the United States likes it or accepts it right now. So psychologically,、uh, the U.S. is、uh, having a very hard time, and it's trying to hold on to its dominance. 
But that's just not possible uh, in a world of uh, diverse uh, talents, skills, innovation, economy, when the U.S. is just 4% of the world population. Yeah, I get the feeling that a lot of people, especially in the West, um, have this idea that they might suffer under a multipolar order. Um, so you, do you think that fear is warranted or can the U.S. and the collective West uh, continue to succeed in a more multipolar world? You know, as an economist, uh, I'm uh, a believer in a win-win world. Uh, I don't believe that globalization or the rise of China or the rise of India or the rise of Africa in any way diminishes the uh, opportunities for well-being in the United States or Europe. Indeed, I think it enhances those possibilities. In any event, we need cooperation to face challenges like human-induced climate change. So for all of those reasons, I believe in a win-win uh, world where uh, gains from uh, trade and uh, advances in economy from technological advances can and should spread around the world. If you are a you know, military strategist or a geopolitical strategist, uh, it seems uh, that the uh, feeling is quite different, that the gain of the other is somehow a loss for you. Uh, and so I know that uh, international relations realists sometimes think that China's rise is detrimental to the United States. It's a different mindset. I think it's a dangerous mindset, actually, to think in that way because it almost inevitably leads to confrontation and the real chance of deadly conflict. And so I want to emphasize the win-win nature of the world economy. Uh, it's not one region's gain necessarily at the expense of the other. Everybody can benefit from the advancement of know-how and technology and scientific understanding. I'm really crossing my fingers. Uh, I, I too am really pushing for a win-win kind of situation. Now, the US and China um, have gone through obviously a really rough patch in terms of relations uh, of late with uh, Nancy Pelosi's provocative trip to Taiwan last year, to Balloon Gate, uh, to these allegations of widespread genocide against the Muslim minorities in Xinjiang, to calls for war by 2025, uh, to the Select Committee on so-called competition with the CPC. And of course, lately, uh, we also have a TikTok and the mainstream media's kind of feverish obsession with Yellow Peril 2.0 kind of painting China as this um, dark, dangerous, dirty dystopia. Why is it, um, do you think, that the US is seemingly uh, so obsessed with uh, tearing China down at the present moment? And what do you think it would take for those relations to improve? I think uh, almost all of this is the result of China's success. Uh, the United States uh, strategists and politicians didn't want a, a, a peer or a, a rival competitor. And then China showed up on the scenes as a large, successful economy that for 40 years plus since 1980 has been one of the most dynamic parts of the world economy and now at the cutting edge of many leading technologies. And I think the United States uh, political class resents this, uh, is fearful of it, the geostrategists who think in terms of uh, zero-sum uh, struggles think that China's advance is to the detriment of the United States. Again, a mindset I don't believe and don't uh, accept and think is uh, actually a very dangerous one. But most of this is a, a reaction to China's success. And I think that it needs to be overcome through systematic dialogue, negotiation, hammering out uh, solutions where there are real differences, not the shouting, the finger pointing, uh, the kind of uh, hysteria. Of course, uh, there's a lot of prejudice built in as well. You mentioned Yellow Peril 2.0. Well, there is some feeling wrong 
in the United States that if China has advanced, they must have cheated to do it. How could they be a competitor with us after all? Uh, this is a uh, pretty ingrained uh, and uh, is wrong. I say to these people, get a passport, go take a visit, go learn something, read some history, understand uh, the long sweep of history. I wrote a book in uh, 2020 called The Ages of Globalization, in which China features for hundreds and hundreds of years as the world leading uh, economy, uh, the source of major technological advances. Uh, I explain uh, the swings that happened afterwards, but I see China's recovering a natural position as one of uh, the world leaders in innovation and technology. And from my point of view, that's all to the good. Uh, but this is not the mindset right now. And I think we have to work hard so that the mindset of fear uh, and zero-sum thinking doesn't overwhelm us and doesn't lead to open conflict, which it could. Mm. Now, speaking of um, having a passport and getting around, um, you've been to a few places. You've given um, economic advice to a number of governments, including those of Mikhail Gorbachev and Boris Yeltsin. And in Poland, um, you were awarded one of that country's highest honours, the Order of Merit, for authorising a comprehensive plan to switch from a central planned model to the market economy. So I was wondering, based on your vast experience in that area, um, how you would summarize China's reform and opening up over the past uh, 40 odd years. And do you agree um, with the idea that um, this country's witnessed kind of an economic miracle that's without precedent? China has been the most successful, sustained 40 year uh, economic development and uh, growth uh, of any large economy in history. Uh, what's happened in the period since 1980 is extraordinary and extraordinarily positive. China went from uh, being a society uh, with most people living in poverty. Uh, the numbers depend on definitions, but 60% poor, some estimate 80% poor, to ending poverty in its extreme form by 2020. Well, that's a phenomenal achievement. Uh, and uh, it reflects uh, a... Uh, mixed economic system, both market and state, private and public, uh, a tremendous capacity to plan uh, at uh, the National Development and Reform Commission, among other institutions, the uh, tremendous capacity to build infrastructure, uh, thousands and thousands of kilometers of fast intercity rail, of uh, roads, of a power uh, system, and so forth. On a, on a massive scale, uh, and the Chinese economy uh, lives on, on that uh, physical infrastructure that connects uh, the entire country. I've been watching this process closely since my first visit to China 42 years ago. So I came in 1981. China was very poor then. This was very clear uh, just by uh, looking uh, at uh, life as one would see it uh, on the streets uh, or in the shops. Uh, I've been visiting China frequently uh, ever since 1981. And what has happened is, is absolutely extraordinary, uh, hugely beneficial for China and beneficial for, for the whole world. Mm. So, so do you think then that China has achieved anything specifically um, in their poverty alleviation process that maybe other states um, might be able to emulate? Well, I, I say to my friends uh, and governments in Africa that look at what China did over a 40-year period. Uh, Africa uses the date, interestingly, of 2063 as its reference point because 2063 will be the 100th anniversary of African unity and the foundation of the organization of African unity, the OAU, which is the precursor of the African Union. So they looked to 2063. Here we are in 2023. Okay, 40 years. Think of China, 1980 to 2020. Think of Africa, 2023 to 2063. Uh, China provides an inspiration and in many important ways, a kind of roadmap. Uh, invest heavily, build infrastructure, uh, get the kids in school, make the quality education, make the real investments 
that build the capacity of the economy. It's not gimmickry uh, that uh, brought China to its uh, current uh, prosperity. It is heavy investments, large scale, over a long period with good planning, uh, good public administration, uh, and uh, educating uh, generations of uh, Chinese young people uh, in uh, skills, uh, in scientific capacity, and so on. So I think there's a, a lot that is a roadmap for other regions. Mm, interesting. Now, to switch gears just a little bit, although kind of related, um, inflation has been a massive problem recently, uh, but China's inflation rate is currently sitting at 1%, uh, while the US is around 6 and the UK is about 10.4%, I think. Um, in layman's terms, how is it that China is able to keep inflation so low, and, and do you think that rate will last? Well, the inflation that uh, is um, being experienced in the U.S. and Europe is the result of uh, dislocations that came from COVID and from the Ukraine war and from the sanctions that were imposed by the U.S. and Europe uh, in the wake of the war and from the policy choices that were made in response to these shocks, uh, especially in the year 2020 when the pandemic broke out, the central banks of the United States and Europe issued a lot of credit, a massive expansion of the money supply. And that turned into inflation by 2022. And the disruptions of the global supply chains, first from COVID itself, but then from the war and the geopolitical tensions with China and the sanctions regimes, when combined with the money expansion, boosted the inflation. China didn't do the same thing. China didn't make this massive monetary expansion in 2020 the way the Federal Reserve did. Uh, and China is not experiencing the same disruptions uh, that uh, came from the sanctions regimes, which have been some sense boomeranged on the sanctioning countries uh, because it's disrupted their own supply chains. So uh, I think this is partly the result of shocks and partly the result of policy choices and I'd say some policy mistakes that were made in the West. There's no reason why this phenomenon has to be uh, a global phenomenon in, in the same way. Mm. Now, I kind of want to flip about 180 degrees. Um, what do you think happened with Nord Stream? Well, Nord Stream was a, um, a project that the United States opposed from its inception. Uh, Nord Stream is the gas pipeline from Russia to Western Europe. And the United States uh, said from the very start that Europe should not buy gas from Russia. I disagree with that analysis, but the U.S. said, well, that will make Europe dependent on Russia. To my mind, it's not a matter of dependency. It's a matter of economics and trade. Russia has a lot of inexpensive gas. Uh, Europe has a great uh, manufacturing capacity. Buying that gas is uh, good for Europe's uh, competitiveness and for production. Uh, and uh, that's where the pipeline idea came from. But the U.S. hated the pipeline. Uh, the U.S. said, well, this uh, makes uh, Europe follow uh, uh, Russia's uh, uh, geopolitics and so forth. I, I think that this was uh, not the right approach. But it all leads me to believe that the most likely scenario of Nord Stream is the U.S. blew it up. Uh, because uh, the U.S. hated the project, the U.S. warned that in the event of a Russian invasion, uh, the pipeline would end. President Biden himself said that uh, on tape on February 7th, 2022. And when the reporter asked, but Mr. President, that's an international project. How can you say it will end? He said, believe me, we have our ways. Well, I think we probably saw those ways with the destruction of the pipeline. It's not proved. Uh, the story that the investigative uh, journalist Seymour Hirsch uh, has put out is very credible, and it has not been 
knocked down in any s- substantive way. And I uh, had the opportunity to speak to the members of the UN Security Council and strongly urged an independent UN-led investigation. Let's get to the bottom of it. Countries know more than they're telling. That we need to investigate. Well, China and Russia and Brazil said, yes, let's investigate. The United States said, no. Uh, well, why do you say no? Uh, we need to find out. So I, I continue to urge uh, the UN to investigate this because we need security of international infrastructure. And when a major pipeline is blown up, it's actually a, a global threat to the peace. What do you think are the chances of the UN um, undertaking an investigation? Well, I hope more and more countries uh, support the idea of an independent investigation because there are many facts that are need to be known. And because if we're going to succeed in fighting climate change, for example, we're going to need a lot of international infrastructure. We want it to be secure. We don't want it to be blown up. So when there is a major piece of infrastructure blown up, I say it's a threat to the peace in the sense that we need fiber, uh, we need uh, pipelines, uh, we need power grids in submarine cables uh, to make our world economy function properly. So we need security of the international infrastructure. Do you think TikTok will be blocked in the US? Uh, We're in a kind of mode of hysteria and panic and anti-China, everything. So everything's possible. Uh, It's really, really discouraging to see our Congress waste time on this. Uh, And uh, the anti-China feeling, you know, has uh, tried to destroy a lot of Chinese companies in recent years. Uh, Mm -hmm. Huawei, another one that uh, was hard hit, but is finding its way around the U.S. uh, sanctions regime. So I don't know what's going to happen, but I hope that uh, Congress calms down. I hope that all of uh, the U.S. uh, geopolitics directed at China calms down. We need dialogue, discussion, uh, negotiation. We don't need a ban on TikTok. Okay, last question for today. Um, Is the U.S a dying empire and um, is all the provocation and calls for war and uh, smearing and so on evidence of the the last, I don't know, desperate throes of US hegemony? And if so, uh, how can we keep safe and avoid nuclear war? Well, look, the, the US is not and cannot be the global hegemon, meaning it can't be the country that runs the world. The U.S. is 4% of the world. There's a lot of talent, creativity, and desire for sovereignty and for a say in world affairs all over the world. So the U.S. is not the world hegemon, but it needs uh, at the political level to get its head around that reality, uh, to uh, have a foreign policy not based on arrogance or illusion, but based on uh, uh, a, an interconnected world and the need for cooperation and peace. And I think it's possible to have that. The U.S. can be quite successful in such a world. Uh, what can't occur is the U.S. running the world. That's not going to happen. Uh, and if the U.S. persists in trying that, it's going to face more and more conflict around the world with uh, other nations. So I think this is a question of uh, the U.S. accepting uh, the principle that we have a multipolar world and that we should make it work properly. Professor Jeffrey Sachs, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Pleasure to be with you. Thank you for having me. Wow, what a great chat there with Jeffrey Sachs. Uh, Before I let you go, though, uh, let's take a quick look at the last Reports on China YouTube poll. I asked you guys if you feel the switch to a multipolar world order is speeding up lately. We had nearly 4,000 votes, a whopping 96% of you said yes, with only 4% saying no. Okay, you guys, that will be it for today, but don't forget to let me know what you think down below. And also hit like and subscribe if you haven't already. I'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.